Hello, everybody. Yeah. Thank you for coming. This is the annual meeting of the Dynamic Coalition on Gender and Internet Governance. I apologize for starting slightly late, but I think we have a complicated scheduling situation where this meeting is followed at 4 o'clock by the gender main session, which is in room 17 upstairs, and we are all part of that. So we've been preparing for that till this moment, literally. What we would like to do at this session, actually, is we would like to focus on three different aspects of gender and internet governance. In previous years, the gender and internet governance discourse has focused already a lot on issues of access and the digital divide with respect to gender. There's been a lot of focus on online violence, which we would again like to talk about. We would also like to look at a couple of other issues that are really important in the gender context. One is data, the whole concept of body as data, the question of publicness, the whole question of the right to be forgotten, how should we look at that through the lens of gender, the issue, the related issue of memory. And so we have three really interesting speakers to talk about these issues today, and we'll have a little time for discussion after all three have spoken. So it is a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Valentina Pelitzer from APC. And Vale, you were going to talk about yeah, the feminist principles of the internet. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. A uh, few years ago, a uh, feminist uh, from the Global South, women's, right, uh, women's human rights defenders, LGBTIQ activists, sexual rights activists, this uh, overlapping sometimes group of, uh, of uh, individuals had uh, met uh, to think around uh, uh, something that is more than a framework, uh, but it's not a chart. And we are the feminist principle of the internet. It's possible that some of you had already heard about them. Uh, but I will, uh, uh, I, what I want to say is that the, the idea and the, and the desire was to have a sort of compass, a compass. How we can navigate our bodies, our issue, into, uh, our issue into a very uh, layered uh, uh, space, like uh, the one that can be the internet governance, or can be the technology, or can be the women's right movement. And so uh, the principle were, uh, uh, were developed into iteration in 2014 and then again 2015, and were uh, um, used online, discussed, uh, discussed on site uh, in different convening, very local, uh, less local, and there are 17. I'm not going to talk about all the principles. I want to focus on some of the principles. There are five main areas which are interesting. One is about access, and access has three dimensions. So it's not only the connectivity issue, but uh, it's related to access to information and how we use technology. Movements, which is relevant for us because it's not only about uh, how we build movement, how we can um, amplify, but also how we bring and where we bring our politics. So there is a specific, uh, uh, a specific principle on internet governance. Because as we know, it's not enough to discuss issue, it's not enough uh, to look at the, at, the, at the problem, to state the problem, but it's really important to be present in each and every level. And the level of policy, the level where issues are discussed and framed, the level where issues are named, because very often issue can be not named or can be considered as an assumption. They are embedded, but no one really spelled them out. And this makes a big difference in the way that which we, in which they will be addressed or not be addressed. And so that's why one of the feminist principles is on internet governance with a specific intention of bringing all women human rights defenders, LGBTIQ people that have a focus, a specific focus in their battle, political battles of digital, of real rights, to make this uh, next step, the conjunction, the link with the, 
with the uh, rights when rights are uh, placed in, uh, in, a, in a virtual reality in the internet uh, or in the different internet. There are many networks. There is just not only the mainstream network that we're very often considered the one and only. And when we talk about digital technology, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, two other, uh, there are two other principles that I find very relevant for our conversation. One is the one on data and privacy. Because a body in the internet is data. All our bits, since the very moment in which uh, we uh, create a persona, is it a login, is it an access, we become data. And all those, those data, all these bits, are stored somewhere are shared with someone, are uh, mm, meshed up, are morphed, are changed, can be uh, amplified, demystified, can be delinked, but we are data. And if we do not uh, discuss about the embodiment, embodiment of being data when we are LGBTIQ people, when, belo when we belong to the discriminated community, when we belong uh, to when we do not belong to the norm, the accepted norm, and we can, uh, we will, I'm not going now into the discussion of the norm, so we need to talk about how data, data that are uh, individuals, that are people, that are discriminated and suffer, uh, uh, how those data are treated, who have control over this data, where and how. So if we don't look at data as embodiment and we don't look at data as agency, the, the ability of the individuals to decide about their own personal data, but also the ability to decide to stay and not to stay. And this is the next, uh, the next uh, step with memory. Because if we come from uh, women's and human rights defenders, women movement, we want to be remembered. We don't want to be forgotten. Because the history, her history, their history, the history of diversity is constantly erased. We fight a battle to be remembered and to have a memory that is a, a memory that we built in collaboration, that it's critical, that it's progressive, but progressive in terms that it change, not progressive in this very binary way, what is progress? Progress, it's really... It's really a flow school, I would say, something that someone invented. So memory is really important. And we need to have uh, at least uh, these three linkages. Internet governance is a space where we need to exercise our right, where we need to name our issue. Data, data is our embodiment in the digital space, in the online space, which is uh, nothing else than another extension, that the same extension, that's a, a variation of our lives. There is no really differences. I cannot see the difference between me now speaking and me now tweeting and the tweet that you will see. There is really no, no, there is a continuum, there is no differences, but I'm not in control of those data because those data belong first to Twitter when I tweet. Those data belongs to specific private corporation and there is all the discussion of the economy and the principle also talk about the economy. But I wanted to relate this with memory. Uh, w there is a lot to reflection about who control the data and what we say in the feminist principle, the really people should have uh, the possibility to control and to know where their data are, how they're treated, who is shared for which purposes. And memory, also the memory to decide and to have the possibility to tell our own story. And this is important because also in the conversation around the right to be forgotten, which is a very complex and articulate conversation, we know the women's story, women's body are very often used as an excuse for the right to be forgotten. But we think also that if a woman was uh, uh, violated and her images were uh, used, morphed against her, this is not an issue about the right to be forgotten. A consent was breached. Uh, those images were an act of violence, an act of arrest against her consent. So we have already meaning and means uh, to address them. Uh, and I will stop here, just having these uh, three uh, feminist principles. They are online, so anyone can, uh, can read, uh, can test, can change. It's a conversation because it's a, it's a movement. And, uh, and then we can continue from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valle, for that very provocative presentation, which I'm sure will attract many questions after this. Our next speaker is Cecile Greboval. Um, Cecile is the program manager of gender mainstreaming in the gender equality unit at the Council of Europe. And Cecile is going to talk about the Council of Europe's work, work on combating online hate speech that is sexist. 
Thank you very much uh, for the invitation, and it's, uh, it's my first forum, so it's uh, quite fascinating. Um, I'm going to talk about the work and the activities of the Council of Europe in relation to uh, online violence and sexist hate speech, like this. So just a uh, few words about the Council of Europe, which is an intergovernmental organization based in Strasbourg, and what we do basically is standard setting monitoring of those uh, standards and also cooperation with our uh, 47 member states on the implementation of the standards. And uh, many colleagues of mine are present here because we also do work on different aspects of internet governance, including freedom of expression, uh, children's rights, a hate speech in general. So uh, you will meet some of us uh, around here. So next. Uh, so in terms of gender equality, gender equality has been a quite important area of work for the Council of Europe, and we do both policy work on this and, and standards, and I'll speak about both in particular in relation to violence against women and sexist hate speech. Next. So in terms of gender stereotypes and sexism, uh, sexism has not been used a lot by international organizations, but for us it's really one of uh, our topics. So this is something that we deal with through um, a gender equality strategy. We have uh, conferences, we have uh, also um, collection of good practices of the policies of the member states. And in two years ago, we've started to work more specifically on sexist hate speech together with non-governmental organizations and looking at both online and offline sexist hate speech mm -hmm. and the, the targets, the different forms, and also making some policy recommendations. And to build on this work, we're also now working on a recommendation on combating sexism in general, mm. which is uh, interesting and quite challenging, uh, especially if you have to find a common definition of what sexism is with 47 member states. So hopefully, uh, by the same time next year, we'll have this recommendation, and it means that there may be a, a, a definition of sexism at the international level, which is, uh, I think would be good because for the moment the work is, is going well. So it's a, it's a quite progressive definition. So we, we'll see about this. The next, please. Uh, now, in terms of the work that we've done on uh, violence against women and sexist hate speech, um, just some figures that maybe you're aware of, that women are 27 times more likely to be harassed online. Looking at Europe, uh, 9 million girls have experienced some kind of cyber violence by the time they are 15. And uh, the fact that there are many forms of violence against women online and of sexist hate speech with the same effect, which is to embarrass, humiliate, scare, silence, and basically can push a lot of women out of online spaces. And what we discussed also quite a lot was uh, the different targets of um, both violence and sexist hate speech. So it's some groups of women, including uh, migrant women, younger women, LGB LGBTQI <laughs> communities, or women who are targeted because of um, their role. So there's been more work lately, for example, on the violence that women politicians face also journalists, uh, a lot also about uh, feminists specifically and women's, uh, women's rights defenders and, and gamers. Next, please. Now, what um, the way we look at sexist hate speech is uh, around the continuum of violence against women, the, the iceberg of um, sexist violence and the fact that for a very long time, inc including um, now, uh, hate speech and especially sexism has been considered harmless, like, oh, mm. it's only a joke. Uh, but we see it as really part <coughs> of uh, a larger climate that um, actually encourages violence against women and that it needs to be addressed because otherwise um, uh, it will never stop. So that's the, our general context to look, to look at this. The next, please. Um, now, looking at the, the standards of the Council of Europe that can be used in this, in this respect, of course, the, the mo 
most well-known standard that we have is the European Convention on Human Rights, um, especially uh, Article 10 on freedom of expression, which uh, is not an absolute right. So what we've been saying when talking about sexist hate speech is that there's no freedom of expression if um, sexist hate speech is actually used to silence women and girls. And even if you look at the convention, it carries um, duties and responsibilities. And it's uh, often read in conjunction with other articles in order to actually um, find the balance between uh, those different rights. The second standard that uh, we are very proud of at the Council mm -hmm. of Europe is the Istanbul Convention. Mm -hmm. It's the mm -hmm. Convention to Combat Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence which is also, can also be used in uh, relation to online violence yes, against sorry. women and sexist hate speech. Uh, in particular, some of the articles, uh, we have, for example, arc Article 12 of the Insta Istanbul Convention, which requires parties to take measures to uh, eradicate prejudice, customs, traditions, based on the idea of the inferiority of women or on stereotyped roles. Uh, so that's quite a strong article that, that can be used in this context. And also some forms of violence against women that take place online can be used, for including sexual harassment and mm. also uh, stalking, which are both um, criminalized by the Istanbul Convention. And another article that can be useful in this context is uh, Article 17, which looks at the responsibility of the media and the IT sector in relation to the promotion or the general acceptance uh, of violence against women. So it means that the, the member states which have actually ratified the Istanbul Convention also have those duty in relation to online the abuse, which is actually not different from um, real life abuse. Uh, the next, please. We also have a series of other standards, which are a committee of ministers recommendation on a series mm -hmm. of, uh, of domains on hate speech, on gender equality and media, on the safety of journalists, which is a recent one, which uh, also looks specifically at um, the vulnerability of women uh, in the media sector. Mm. And lastly, also some work done by the Human Rights Commissioner of the Council of Europe on hate speech and also specific work that is uh, has done on women women's rights defenders. And we've also started to look at what um, member states are doing. Uh, and in Europe, a number of um, countries, of course, have um, sanctions for acts of uh, of sexism, of sexism and of sexist hate speech in uh, in different ways. The next, please. Uh, now, the, the actions that have been ad identified uh, to to actually combat online violence and sexist hate speech is, of course, first to look at the balance between uh, freedom of speech and sexist hate speech and try to deconstruct that, uh, that notion and uh, to be a bit stronger and less tolerant of, of online violence. Uh, the second I is to introduce change um, to include gender and sex in hate crime legislation because it's not the, the case in, uh, in all European countries. Uh, another one is to look at the responsibility of platform pro providers in relation to moderation, and to cooperation with uh, law en enforcement. Uh, fourth one is to use uh, regulatory powers with respect to um, media and incitement to violence against women, because in some countries, in some European countries, there's quite some strong legislation on how uh, media should not um, incite violence against women and uh, sexism and hate in general. The next. And another one is to look at self-regulation and codes of conduct to educate the police and justice professional to first detect but also respond and prosecute the violence. 
providing support and remedies to victims, which is an important part of the Istanbul Convention. Promote uh, also civil society initiatives in this area, and lastly, to research the phenomenon and gather data, because we do have some data, but um, not necessarily enough. And finally, the aim should be that uh, digital space is uh, seen as real world and that the, the violence that women are facing in the digital space is not less important, but it's less, it's the, it has the same reality as what uh, we face in, in real world and that the um, digital space is uh, uh, also a place where the rule of law and justice and equality is uh, respected. So that was me. We have, um, I've put some, our publication on sexist hate speech at the back of the room if you're interested and yeah, you sure. should go to the next. Uh, this is our also our website if you want to do, to see what um, we are doing in general on, on gender equality issues. Thank you. One sec. Yes, thank you so much, Cecile. I was actually delighted when you said that there's a attempt by 47 member states to define sexism and would love to hear more about that, right? Like that really sounded groundbreaking to me, to be honest. Yeah, you had a question. Do you want to just wait till the uh, last speaker's done or would you like to, if you'd like? Okay, go ahead, yeah. My name is Shay. I'm founder of Glitch, an organisation that campaigns and trains around online violence and hate speech in the UK. And I just wondered what the unique thing about Glitch is that we're intersectional. We don't just see women as with one identity, we see them as multiple identities. And I really welcome what you've said, but I'm also a bit disheartened that uh, the work is around, I guess, white women. But what about, I don't receive just uh, racism, uh, sexism, I receive racism too. And as the academic Moya Bailey co uh, coined it, it's misogynoir. And so how is the Council of Europe going to take in those nuances? Women who are black or disabled or LGBT or trans, it's really important to, to, to speak for all women. So please. Yes, of course, and I couldn't uh, develop more what I was saying, but this is also our aim. And uh, um, maybe less so in the past, but we are working on our new gender equality strategy where this aspect of uh, looking in more into women's diversity, different identities will be uh, much more prominent. And especially on the work on sexist hate speech, we also try to work with our colleagues uh, being in the youth department who have the... Um, the hate, hate speech, um, the movement against hate speech, hate crime, they've been working a lot for the last years, but the gender aspect was not always very present, so we're trying to work more uh, with them, but also with the uh, colleagues working on gender identity and sexual orientation, so of course, this is uh, very important for us, including more um, focus also on uh, migrant and, and refugees women mm. in the future. Mm. Uh, because it wasn't very present in our work in the past, but mm. now mm. it's going to be also one of the, of the priorities. So it's a question really of link linking, and that's, that's one of the challenges in a big organization that you try to link and to have also a gender mainstreaming approach in the other areas, because otherwise you also have people working specifically on racism that don't take into account the gender no. aspect. No. Oh, so yes. we're trying to do it both ways, mm. try to push our colleagues to do more about gender equality and also for us to be a bit more critical about what we do in terms of um, yeah, being Thank more you. inclusive. But you're right, it's, it's one of the big challenges. Thank you. Okay, we move on to our final speaker who is uh, Professor K.S. Park, who teaches at Korea University Law School and is also one of the founders of OpenNet Korea. Since 2006, Professor Park has also served as the executive director of the PSPD Law Center, which is a nonprofit entity that has organized several high-impact litigations in the areas of free speech, privacy, and copyright, and actually, I'd just like to contextualize the talk that KS, as he's popularly known, is going to give. So at the IGF last year, a new dynamic coalition was formed. That's the Dynamic Coalition on Publicness and 
Professor Park is one of the conveners of this dynamic coalition. It's been the intention of the dynamic coalition on gender and internet governance to actually really try and do collaborative work with other dynamic coalitions which have sort of relevant agendas and are interested in working collaboratively. So at the Asia Pacific Regional IGF, after a presentation that Professor Park made on the right to be forgotten and publicness, we had a discussion and we said, let's try and evolve a position related to the right to be forgotten, bringing in publicness, but also bringing in the question of gender. And it is in this context that Professor Park is actually going to make a intervention today. Thank you for warm and uh, kind uh, introduction. Um, let me first uh, start saying something about start by saying something about uh, right to be forgotten, and this is a uh, uh, position of uh, our dynamic coalition. Um, we believe that the real motive for right to be forgotten is a people's desire not to be unreasonably discriminated for their past conduct um, or images of uh, their uh, past conduct, if uh, you wish. Um, but if that is the real motive behind right to be forgotten, blinding ourselves from one another's conduct is not an effective or proportionate way of uh, addressing and combating unreasonable discrimination. Um, that, uh, those two sentences can be taken to uh, gender discrimination or other forms of discrimination. NCND can never be an effective policy to combat discrimination uh, against uh, homosexuality. Um, forcing people to be silent about their identities, whether racial or sexual or in other regards, uh, and then treating them equally is, is, uh, uh, is only a pretension of uh, uh, equality. Uh, people should control when, how, where they can uh, share, uh, they can disclose their identities, uh, social, uh, sexual, uh, racial. Um, what Right We Forgotten uh, allows is it gives uh, people in general, not just the people who need to fight discrimination, but people in general, right to force other people to uh, forget uh, by suppressing uh, availability of, uh, 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 availability of uh, uh, information. Fighting discrimination, uh, it cannot be done in a binary way. It cannot be done only by law. Um, I majored in physics. I, did, uh, I used to do uh, experiments in labs. Uh, so many times the results come out wrong. I do the experiments again, uh, and you know I track back, and there are always some things that I did wrong, and I always wonder how come. I mean, there are like different possibilities of uh, uh, you know using the tool, uh, using the tool uh, that, that I use for experiment. There, are, there are different possibilities. How come I don't lock? Uh, how, how come I don't ever lock out? Right? How come? I always make a mistake when I could, by mistake, get it right, right? I think uh, uh, progress can be made that way, making us blind to some of the information out there, making us blind to, uh, you know, what we see as uh, discrimination, what we see as oppression. Uh, trying to suppress information about that, um, that will only 
give us power to pretend toward the progress uh, while failing to achieve real progress. Only by opening up the space for ethical discourse broadly and widely uh, by confronting what is really going on in the real world, we can achieve progress. So that is the position of uh, our dynamic uh, coalition on uh, right to be forgotten. And uh, and in that sense, right to be forgotten has uh, hampered uh, people's uh, ability to achieve progress. I served on uh, Korean government's internet censorship board. I was opposition party nominee uh, appointed for the purpose of uh, uh, blocking censorship efforts from the majority party uh, nominees. Some of the first right we forgotten requests that we received came from conservative politicians who wanted to erase their sexist comments and racist comments that they've made in the past. They wanted to be forgotten in relation to uh, those comments. There, I saw the potential of uh, right to be forgotten uh, abused, right, uh, potential right to be forgotten used against, uh, uh, against the human rights. Data protection law uh, is an attempt at equality. Now, when you get services from companies and uh, government agencies, you turn over your uh, data. Now, if that data is used beyond the scope that you approve and disclosed to the people beyond uh, your consent, that constitutes surveillance. That constitutes uh, a violation of your uh, digital uh, freedom or your freedom of uh, information. Now, there is one way of uh, addressing that. Well, you can sue the companies and governments for not complying with, uh, uh, not complying with uh, 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 strictures, or not complying with uh, uh, scopes that you consented to. But not all, not all of us have uh, uh, resources to negotiate over or enforce the conditions of uh, disclosing uh, our information to companies and governments. Data protection law came in as an equalizer, wanted to equalize the unequal bargaining power between individuals and companies and governments by assuming, by assuming that you own data about yourself. So even if you don't negotiate over the condition of, uh, condition of dis disclosure, the companies and governments cannot use the information for any purpose that you didn't explicitly agree to. That's the idea behind data protection law. But if data protection law is used, is, uh, uh, is invoked as a legal basis for right to be forgotten, it will work against equality. It will undo the equalizing role that is supposed to serve in the data space. So uh, that's why we thought that uh, vulnerable people or people fighting for progress, people fighting against uh, discrimination should pay attention to the issue of right to be forgotten because uh, uh, as data protection law is uh, uh, spreading around the world, uh, make, no mistake, make no mistake about it, I'm in full support of uh, strong data protection law. But together with the data protection law comes a provision uh, provision, provision instituting right to be forgotten. I think it's a poison pill. Mm -hmm. I think that we should support uh, legislation of uh, data protection laws around the world, but make clear warnings that it should not be used, uh, it should not be used to shut down the ethical space uh, where people can confront the realities uh, of oppression and discrimination in the real world. So um, I want to make a proposal uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Dynamic Coalition on Right to Be Forgotten and also 
uh, on behalf of the, some members of uh, uh, Dynamic Coalition on Gender and Internet Governance uh, who worked uh, uh, with us um, on this. Uh, the proposal is to issue a joint statement on gender and right to be forgotten, which reads, uh, and I, can, I mean, uh, there is no written statement, which will include uh, the following points. Um, examples, of, uh, uh, examples of revenge porno, examples of uh, forced coming out of uh, 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 forced coming out on sexual orientation, are, uh, and also um, uh, also uh, revelation about uh, you know former sex workers. Uh, these are usually the examples used by the proponents of right to be forgotten um, as a, uh, as a, a justification for uh, uh, for that. Uh, uh, for that principle. Uh, however, uh, the first point is that uh, these issues, uh, revenge for no, forced to coming out, um, and revelation of uh, uh, former sex workers, all these issues can be addressed by pre-existing laws of privacy, uh, not with the right to be forgotten, which allows people to take down, suppress, information of any kind, even information that they voluntarily uh, posted or even information uh, that they, uh, that they uh, uh, voluntarily uh, attracted attention to. Um, what, so that, that's, the, that's the first point, that there are existing laws uh, that uh, address the concerns about uh, these uh, uh, typical uh, cases uh, cited by uh, right to forgotten proponents. The second uh, point is that if you want to address those concerns, then there has to be more vigorous prosecution of uh, sex crimes or sex-related crimes. For instance, uh, Korea, we have a special law uh, that, criminal that criminalizes <coughs> criminalizes. Uh, posting or distribution of uh, uh, revenge porno, and uh, vigorous prosecution of uh, uh, those laws uh, should gather more uh, resources, uh, more enforcement resources than right to be forgotten. Also, uh, there will be a, um, um, and also the second point is that uh, women should not be used as uh, vulnerable groups that uh, need uh, right to be forgotten uh, when uh, right to be forgotten can be uh, abused, can be used in reverse to uh, suppress people's information, suppress what people know about powerful elites uh, sharing of racist comments or sexist comments. The third point uh, is that there can be a, a very narrow uh, category of, uh, uh, category of uh, informa information that uh, can be uh, or should be suppressed, like a video of uh, rape uh, that uh, needs to be uh, suppressed uh, for, uh, that, that, that needs to be suppressed uh, no matter what. Uh, in the same line of logic as uh, child pornography uh, needs to be uh, suppressed. And uh, those uh, types of, the enforcement on those types of uh, 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 data uh, can be strengthened by allowing people to share more information uh, about what they see and what they confront in the uh, real world. So uh, those are the three points that we're gonna include in the joint statement. Uh, so. Uh, I, I guess the leaders of your coalition will uh, talk about how you're gonna, uh, you know, uh, arrange the process of uh, all of you working together and uh, uh, approving uh, on it. So that is my proposal. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Thank you, KS. So, you know, what we would like to do is actually this is 
a draft proposal, and it needs to actually circulate much more before it can be finalized. So we asked KS to actually just share the seeds of this proposal for today. And then the gender, the dynamic coalition on gender and internet governance has a list. So we would like to put this proposal out on that list as well as circulate it among sort of some of the other gender coalitions, gender and technology coalitions that we work with and then sort of see what are the kinds of comments that come in and how this needs to be revised. But as a first step towards that, as well as a first step towards some of the things that Valet and Cecile have s said, which have also raised really interesting questions ranging from sexism to hate speech to sexist hate speech to body as data, memory, etc. I would like to invite you all to share thoughts, feedbacks, comments. And also I want to say that I think it's just best uh, to say what you feel, particularly in the context of the right to be forgotten, which I think is a complicated issue, which we are not trying to sort of come to a very clear finale at this point, right? Like this is really an opening conversation, yeah. Yes, and please introduce yourself. Good afternoon, I'm Beatrice, I'm from Brazil. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm the odd one out, usually <laughs> here at the IGF. And I work with, I research uh, gender and technology, basically the internet some, and sexuality, sometimes violence. Well, I, I did had a m have a more general uh, opinion to give about uh, what Valentina said and the feminist uh, principles of internet. I think very, I, I applaud these initiatives because when one's talking about women, women's rights, sexuality, LGBT community, LGBTQI, uh, whichever terms one uses, one forgets to also, we're, we're often thinking about protection and we forget to think about the right to access our sexuality in a healthy way. And ever since media has been created, we have used media as a form of sexual pleasure. So the more the more barriers and laws people create, people are gonna find ways to use it for pleasure and also for violence, unfortunately. But one question I have about the right to be forgotten that I've always posed to people who work in the technical part of technology is, is it technically possible to remove a contact from the internet forever? And every time I've gotten the answer, no. So this is just something to think about because we sometimes we're discussing something mm -hmm. and technically we're not even close to getting there. And that, that bothers me and scares me. immediate questions otherwise would you like to yeah go ahead yeah <coughs> hey again um the with the right to be forgotten i think there's a caveat to that i'm happy for you to be forgotten because we need to live in society where we forgive i think so long punishment equals uh, retribution and having to like beat yourself and be fired or you know prison and actually there are different forms of punishment and for me, it's about understanding where you did wrong. So as a woman that campaigns around racism, I'm forever having to challenge uh, the white, white, white racist system and white privilege. I don't need to sentence all white people to prison. <laughs> I just need white people to be better. So what you can do for me is to be better. And so if you have tweeted something in 2006, and we've seen that actually quite recently with a few um, well, well like famous celebrities who have said something quite controversial, particularly my generation, we've grown up on the internet, we've said really terrible things. A at school, it was, co it was common to say, this is gay, half caste, and use yeah. the N-word. So we've grown up on the internet, and, 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 and therefore we have grown. So I'm happy to forgive you, and therefore you exert your right to be forgotten. If you're truly a different person, if you've truly learned not to use those terms, I don't want you to have this right to be forgotten so you can easily have a clean LinkedIn CV and get a job and then be in a more powerful position to exert your white privilege. Uh-uh. So it, there needs to be a caveat around this kind of freedom of being forgotten. Yeah. 
Okay, would you like to respond? Anybody from the panel? Yeah. Uh, I see that you may want to forgive. There may be other people who find that uh, very relevant in their decision making about that person. What Rights Be Forgotten does is it doesn't allow those ethical choices to be made by individuals. It prevents other people who may find that very relevant, right? It forces those people into blindness uh, when they deal with, you know, whatever, you know, white supremacist that, that you are talking about, or former white supremacist that you are talking about. Uh, so this is really uh, something that should remain in the ethical space that is brought into mandatory legal space. That's why we think right to be forgotten law is a problem. Although right to forgive, I think, is uh, uh, something that we should ethically, you know, encourage Ethically, we should share, uh, but if you make it law applied across the board, that uh, will force, you know, for forced forgiving is not forgiving. Uh, to the first, to the first question, mm. yeah, to the first question about uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the battleground right now is actually. Uh, suppressing circulation of information, not deleting information, uh, you know, permanently. Um, so even right to forgotten proponents are not really arguing uh, to delete information uh, completely. Uh, now, I can say two things about your question. One is deleting the information itself. Uh, people working on child pornography uh, have had that experience. The only way to do that is, I think, criminal prosecution. That's why I think that we, every country, needs law like Korea that has a specific criminal provision for disclosing and distributing uh, revenge porno uh, instead of leaving it up to, uh, you know, a civil lawsuit. Um, and. Uh, 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 the other thing I can say about is something probably not memorable, not memorable enough because I forgot. So <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that later. Yeah. Okay, just before we move on, actually, I am going to ask Valley to con uh, moderate the rest of the session and be a speaker, simply because we've actually had two unfortunate coincidences. One is Usually we get 90 minutes for the dynamic coalition sessions. This year it's been cut down to 60, which makes it very tricky. But this one is even more tricky because from three to four we have the dynamic coalition on gender and internet governance. And right after that in five minutes is the ge main session on gender in room 17. And I'm one of the moderators. So I feel like I have to rush there. So I apologize for this. But uh, Vale, if you could sort of conclude the session and have Cecile and Professor Park and yourself contribute, that would be great. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so before we all leave the room, because I think we all want to be there, so if there is any comment <coughs> that you think is relevant, we might just uh, hear. And then if there is something memorable that we want to say, if not, we all together move uh, to to the gender where we can again uh, address the state and share our. So I would say just if there is something that you think it's really relevant that is important to this conversation to be heard. I, I just want to conclude uh, uh, my presence uh, because I made a specific proposal. I, I stuck my neck out in the, uh, on, on, the, on the cutting block here. So uh, I, I just want to uh, you know, remember uh, my input uh, with the following uh, statement. I mean. We, we can we can never lock out or no we can never lock into a progress uh, we cannot just let progress take its own course while blinding ourselves to what goes on in the real society uh, we need the full truth to uh, make progress it is in that sense that we are trying to fight uh, against the spread of uh, right to be forgotten 
in the form it is now. I want to just say one line, one sentence, if you think it's important. I don't want to. Hmm? Yeah? OK. Thank you very much. There is a mailing list. If you're really, if you're interested in uh, seeing the proposition, commenting, and input, just subscribe to the mailing list. It's a, uh, it's at the moment the most uh, democratic way of participation when there is a pressing, uh, uh, a pressing, main uh, session on gender, the first one, and peop and we take this to the yes, and we will bring this to the main stage. Thank you very much for the patience. <laughs> no, I, I never, I never had any chicken cat. But, but I, had, I was, I enjoyed the really yeah. uh, listening to you, to you yeah. in, in, uh, in yeah. the original uh, album of Happy Hour Ideas. That was very cool. I like your uh, accordion uh, introduction. Because we, we did, as I could see, a lot yeah. of things in your novel that we forgot yeah. when we went. Yeah. And uh, there is and the issue of power that you say okay. that, yeah. that is always there. Yeah. And yeah. fragile yeah. democracy will not be. So you look at the power of you know, yeah. We yeah. really need a strong oh. rule of law oh. wow. that okay. no um, one has in this power? moment. Yeah, because sorry, everyone is free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And but do you think so? This is a novel. You gave me this 60 pages. It will be a recommendation. Fragile democracy. Yeah. Yes, yes, because yeah, yeah. and this is the very the danger because you have no recourse to justice, and we need to be really careful of the real power.